He liked Bud's. I liked it. It sucked at times, of course, but just the learning about my body, what I can and can't do, and then the mindset piece of it all, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, we as humans have so much more potential than our goals. Yeah. Like, we might have, like, I want to accomplish this. The truth is, you, you set your, you know, the standard here, bro, you should be shooting up here. Yeah. We see it all the time. I see it all the time. I'm sure... I'm sure you realize the same thing. It's like, wait, I can do way more than this. Yeah. Way more. You know, when you're like, it's something as simple as like, I can't do any more push-ups. I can't do any more. And then they're like, hey, you're, you're out of here if you don't knock out five more and you knock out seven. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> I mean, we can. You know, our, our brain, you know, our brain is our, our worst enemy and it's our best asset. Plain and simple. What was your, what was your favorite part of Buds? <sighs> Gosh. I really... I really enjoyed like the camaraderie of being with the boys. I really liked it. I I liked the surf torture. You liked the surf torture. I I mean it sucked. I just I like fed off of it. Like I get like if I do sparring or something like that or whatever and I get my bell rung, it like amps me up. I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay." Like the, I'm I'm stimulated by a little bit of pain. Okay. And that would bring on a little pain and just motivate me more. Like, you can't break me. I just had that, you can't break me. You can't break me. I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what I thought to myself all the time. And then seeing people quit motivated me. Really? Yeah. Like, all right, it's not made for you. It's made for me, though. And I would just, I would give myself that self-talk. And a lot of that got me through. And And the guy to my left and my right, you know? I tried to hang out with the good people, the, the one with the good personality, the ones that tried to make you laugh. Yeah. Not the one like, this sucks. When is this going to end? Like, I did, I'd, I'd like, get away from the toxicity. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 9 11 happened when you were in Buds. Second phase, yeah. What yeah. was that like? Uh, surreal. It was, it was weird. I remember just getting my tray. Uh, I was at the cafeteria, galley, chow hall, whatever you want to call it, getting my food. And I was, and I was walking out of the line to the table area and, you know, on the backside, they got all these, all the TVs and like, everyone's like paused. It's like someone hit pause on the remote and you know, the, the frame stands still. I'm like, what the heck's going on? Like, I'm not paying attention. I'm looking, looking at my food. Like I can't wait to devour this. Right. I put my tray down and the guys that I'm sitting down with, they're like, just stare. They're just glued to the TV. I'm like, Hey, what's going on? And they just like point up and I'm like. And all I see is one of the, I think one of the, one of the towers, I don't know if it was one or two, one of the towers was, was, was going up in smoke. And then the second one came in and I don't remember exactly what I saw, but I could, I mean, I could tell it was an attack. And right at that moment, it was like, okay, but did we just get attacked? And then, you know, the thoughts go, well, they push us through training. Like, yeah. are we going to go to the fight? It just, you just kind of knew instinctively, like, hey, like it's about, it's about to get real. Not that it wasn't real before. And and to say it didn't change the mindset a little bit would be uh, doing disservice of that whole event. But yeah, it kind of, I mean, you know. Yeah. It, it's different. It's different when there's actively something going on versus something something could be going on, which was which is what the case was, you know, first phase and a little bit of second phase, which is like, you know, we'll, we'll answer the call when it comes. But now it's like, okay, the threat is imminent. It's real. Here it is. Let's go. Yeah. So it kind of tweaked, tweaked your brain a little bit. Did you guys have any, did you have anybody quit after? I mean, nobody quits after Hell Week. Uh, I don't think we had anyone quit. I mean, we had, you know, the basic injuries. We had to roll somebody, but I don't think anyone quit to my, to my knowledge. That's, there was guys that got kicked out, Yeah, you know, uh, that, that wasn't fit in the mold, I guess. But I don't think anyone quit. Okay. So, but I don't, I'm not hundred percent on that. Yeah. Dude, you know how it is. Do you're like looking through your, the toilet paper roll. Yeah. Not seeing, you know, the big picture of everything. You're like, God, just let like, just get me through this hour. Just get me through this minute. Just get me through the next five seconds. Did the instructor staff change at all? Um, after nine 11? My memory's a little foggy, but I mean, they would have to, I yeah. know one of our instructors had a, a his, his fiance or wife was a uh, flight attendant on a flight from somewhere to New York that morning. It wasn't her flight, but I, I could see them doing stuff and we were kind of we were kind of brought into the classroom and kind of debriefed what was known, which wasn't a lot, 
about what was going on. Uh, but you know, you could see it in their eyes. You you can see it in their eyes. Yeah, yeah. You could you can see it. So you finish buds. You go. Did you go to team two right away? Team two right away. Yep. You went to team two. I wound up at team two later. Yeah, because you went to eight first. I, believe, I went to eight and first. Then we crossed then I over. went to two. Yep. And when I got to two, your guys' platoon or your task unit, I guess I should say, was like the golden task unit. I don't know what you guys did. It was we had the influence from our tier one guys. Oh, we're gonna find out. What were you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, what were you guys doing over there? Uh I mean, you know, we had our the way it started, you know, the first couple of weeks, because we jumped in right when workup was starting, I believe. Okay. For the first deployment. Uh, and, you know, Iraq was, I think, or sorry, Afghanistan was going, or when did Iraq start kicking off? Iraq started kicking off right in 2003. Okay, so I would have been, it was like during that time, both of them were kicking off. So it was like, okay, where are we going? And we, you know, we didn't know, but we're assuming we're going to go get in the fight. But our our leadership that came from the other side of the street, our tier one guys, they... Um, they changed the whole way we did business and they made it more like them. So instead of like, hey, we got two platoons and you guys were all doing the same stuff, they kind of made it like, hey, we got our mobility guys, we got our sniper element, and then we got our assaulters. And uh, they changed it all. And so I was with the assaulting side and just kind of fell in love with the breaching. In that deployment, I just wanted to go to breaching school, but it was rare for new guys to go, thus there was a spot. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't go, but I was like this secondary breacher i would like just i was mentored by a lot of a lot of solid dudes um and uh just like hung on to every word and just tried to like soak up as much as possible and i just fell in love with the breaching world well, what did you think of the seal teams when you first showed up was it everything you thought it was going to be uh i thought it would be it had a conventional taste to it and i only say that after being at the tier one unit i only mm -hmm. say that I wouldn't have probably known better, but it was like, oh, we can't let you out until like four. I was like, are we are we babies? Like, if we had nothing to do, send guys home. Yeah. Especially when you're always on training trips, you have deployments. Like, we have a thing called families, and I think that's a a problem we have is we want to know why divorce rate is ninety percent. A lot of it's based off of stupidity, because yeah. we think that this is the way it's supposed to be, dude. We, we, we preach this unconventional mindset, this, that we are unconventional, we, we're, you know, we do the guerrilla warfare, right? But yet when it comes to, you know, sticking to the 4.30 or 4 o'clock rule, like, come on, man, like, let's, let's, we're done. We're not, we're not regular military here. Yeah. You're expecting guys to fight and get shot at. Where did you wind up deploying to on that first one? The first one, we were kind of like, Dragged around. First, we were told we're going to Germany. Then we're going to Guam. Then we're going to South America. And we were like, what the heck? And then we were going to Iraq. And then Iraq pulled out. Then we went to Iraq. So we, we went to Missoula up north. And we were just like, you guys are going to be doing DAs. We're like, really? Like, yes. <laughs> like, yes. So we went up there. Uh, and our first two months was up there. And it was it was cool. It was really cool. Like, it was, it was eye-opening. It was like just busting breaching the doors down going in and kind of like SWAT style but the whole time we did there I don't I don't believe one shot was fired I mean because you're not obviously getting the the high value targets the HVTs you're getting kind of the lower ranking or whatever the intel says that we should be going uh but it was cool it was like in the in the progression and the progression of my career and like getting the experience it's probably it was awesome like it wasn't like boom 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 right away mm -hmm. it was gradual that would come later uh but it was good until and then, you know, two months in, we get the PSD piece, the the, the security d detail down in Baghdad uh, when the interim government came in. So we packed up all our stuff, which we weren't proud of. Yeah. And to be honest, we like didn't even train for PSD. Yeah. Really. So we were kind of like, all right, this is what it looks like. I mean, we did a little bit, uh, but not... Not like, hey, this is going to be your mission overseas here. We're going to do a workup for it. We didn't do that. Uh, it was kind of like on-the-job training. But, you know, we pick you pick it up, right? Yeah. You know, like bad guys, the way they think. All right, let's defend. But instead of, you know, up in Missoula, when you're, you know, when you're taking it to the enemy, when you're on the offensive, now you're on the defensive. You're waiting to get hit by the vehicle-borne IED on the side of the road. 
your guy that you're watching or constantly around is a target. Uh, I mean, when we had Alawi, uh years before, he was up in uh, England, and Saddam sent his guys up there, and, and he got the, sent assassins to kill him. And, it, and he had scars all over his face from hatchets that they took to him when he was sleeping. Holy and he survived shit. it. Like, it took him a year to come back, but, like, just seeing those scars on his face, like, much respect, you know? And, and a lot of people say he was DC's pup, uh, puppet. And he might have been, you know, now that we're learning, right, um, about this government. Uh, I don't, but I don't know. But, you know, the guy was anti-Saddam. I mean, especially when someone tries to kill you, I'm probably not going to be friends with you after. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan's show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.